If you remember nothing else from this video, remember that before you do any digging, you need to understand what is under the soil on your site. There are expensive and dangerous utilities running under the ground, and they could be anywhere, and hitting them can be a serious and expensive problem. Now we're going to talk about call before you dig and 811 and all the other mechanisms for getting in contact with these people in a later video, but for now just know that all of the utilities have already been marked with paint. Mark the entire property and I've indicated the property with white arrows. What I'm doing here is transferring the drawings that I've generated and that I've received from my engineers from paper to soil. We're utilizing the professional services we paid for and so I want to make sure I follow their plan exactly. The starting place is the property line that Carl Sweden, our surveyor, helped me identify. I can establish this line and then use these marks to locate the footings and thus the retaining walls exactly so the excavator gets it in the right spot. So before your excavator shows up, you've got to have this taken care of. You've got to make sure your site is fully prepped. With the string set, with some of the paint marks made on the south side and on the west side, now I need to mark the line on the west side for the retaining wall excavation on the hill. Rather than using a string, I'm just marking elevation because if the, el if the excavation is marked at a consistent elevation, even though the wall will be curved slightly, it will fit the site perfectly. The purpose of this retaining wall, of all of the retaining walls, of this whole effort is to maximize our buildable lot size. It would be very self-defeating to do all this work and not have it in exactly the right spot. Now these paint marks are going to disappear very quickly once the equipment starts digging. In fact, some of them go as soon as they start scraping off the deleterious material, and by that I mean anything organic that could rot. That'll be exported and thrown away. But I will come back and update these marks throughout the day in order to make sure that these guys know exactly where they're supposed to dig. I've hired my friend Brian Reynolds and his crew to do this excavation work. It is certainly, of course, possible to rent equipment and do this yourself, but in reality, it usually does not make sense. Professional equipment operators are extremely efficient in their operation. The machine, operated by a professional, is almost always doing two to three movements at the same time, with very little or no wasted motion. This translates to much faster and usually much more accurate work. So by having professional operators in the machine, I am free to stay on the ground, verify measurements, oversee depths and cuts and locations so that the work is being done correctly. It's far less expensive for me to hire these professionals, make sure that all of the work is done the way it needs to be done the first time, than to rent equipment have the rent extend for much longer than I ever intended, and when I send it back, find out I didn't get it right. A man, a woman, we all have to know our limitations. And in this case, I'm money ahead to have Brian Reynolds handle this. Excavation contractors and excavator bid documents generally specify that they are to work within a tolerance of a tenth of a foot. Now sometimes it's even more specific than that and it will specify that they can be up to a tenth too high and no more than two tenths too low. Varies plan to plan but sort of industry standard is get the grade within a tenth. A tenth of a foot is an inch and a quarter. You're watching me climb in and out of the digging area with my laser, taking readings, and then communicating, communicating to the operator, Dexter, how many tenths deeper he needs to go, or if he's already some number of tenths too deep and he needs to come up a certain amount. It's important to be accurate here because if we don't go deep enough and the equipment leaves, I'll probably be back in here with a pick and a shovel getting it down to grade. 
If we go too deep, it means shoveling extra gravel back into the hole to make up for the additional depth. Now, I don't really want either of these things to happen, so I'm keeping a close eye on the grade. But if I have to pick one or the other, I would certainly want to be too deep, not too shallow. Gravel doesn't cost much. It's inch minus. You can shovel it easy. You can grade it easy. You can wet it and compact it, and it comes right up to strength. And so it's always better to be a little too deep than a little too shallow. Working close to an excavator while it's working is one of the most dangerous things that you can do in construction. Counterintuitively, you're actually in much more risk when you're up close to the machine because the operator cannot see you when you're up close. Some of these things are so big that you could go, go underneath of his field of view, be next to a track. These machines can move very quickly. There's a scissoring potential between the turning cab and the tracks themselves. And then, if you do try to get away, when the operator doesn't see you, you've got to go a long ways to get out beyond the reach of the boom. So any time you undertake to go close to an operating excavator, you better have your running shoes on, you better have your brain engaged, and you better be in visual contact with that operator. So you probably noticed I'm not wearing a hard hat. You know, I, I wear a hard hat a lot. Maybe not enough. I wear a hard hat every time I go into the woods to do any logging, without exception. And there are plenty of other times that I never forget it. I didn't feel like I needed one today, but let me tell you what. Anytime you feel like you ought to have a hard hat on, go get it. And if you want to make it a habit to wear it every day when you get out of the truck onto the job site, good on you. I've got not a thing against it. At the time, I figured there was no risk of something falling out of the sky and landing on my head, so I just went to work. The real safety measure around an excavator like this is staying away from the machine and never assuming that the operator can see you or knows what you're doing. It's especially dangerous to go near the tracks or within the swing radius of the cab or, in fact, of the boom. One of the things we learned as we began to cut into the hillside on the south side, the tall cut, Right away, we could see that our geotechnical engineer, Carl Broda, was exactly right in his soils report and what he told us to expect about the condition of the soil. It was very soft, very few rocks, not well compacted, but it was no surprise. In fact, that was the reason we were undertaking this project. What was a surprise was in digging into the hillside on the west side, finding out that it was pretty much solid rock, shale at least. Now, not a real high grade of shale, but still rock. This hillside on the west is not going anywhere and the retaining wall we're going to put here going to look great but probably won't be holding much weight back. Now there's no problem with that but it's going to introduce the dynamic of having a house that is bearing on utterly immovable soil on one side of the property and soil that has to be remediated and compacted on the other side. That will be a problem that we'll deal with when we get to it. A really interesting thing happened as we were finishing up, finishing up the lower part of the digging on that tall south face, and we barely caught it on camera. See that 14-foot cut? See that hillside slough off right here? That was probably 100 cubic yards of dirt that just gave in to gravity and broke free. Now, it was not a huge surprise because of how tall the cut was and the soil was not well compacted, the way to prevent this is to bench the cut, that is, slope it back to reduce the overburden that's tending to pull everything straight down. As you cut that back at somewhere near its angle of repose, which is the angle where the soil will naturally retain its shape, you can reduce the tendency for this to happen. Now, there are specific rules about how large the benching should be, how far you can go with the vertical face. This is the best we could do on our project. 
Now, a slough off like this could be incredibly dangerous and very expensive if it was to happen while you were A, standing underneath of it, or B, had your rebar in place and were just about to pour the footing. So keep an eye on how far down you're going without benching back the top and reducing the sliding moment of the soil. We were lucky on this one. This footing is on the west side, and it is by far the most delicate excavation of the project because it has to be absolutely right both in location and in grade. The location on the west side is right up against a public utility easement, and I am not to intrude on that easement at all. So Dexter is digging to almost a zero tolerance as he is uh, scooping this thing out. On the right side, his right, my left, your left. The tolerance is not so critical, but it still has to achieve the minimum width of footing specified by the engineer. The location of the elevation changes in these steps also has to be specific because the Simons form systems that's going to go, that are going to go in here are only available in certain widths. That means the steps in these footings have to occur within a fairly narrow range of distance from the corner, and now is the time that I have to get it right. So you shouldn't assume that just because you're digging dirt, you can work rough. Sometimes you have to be really careful, and this is just one more instance when I'm glad I've got somebody in the seat of an excavator that knows exactly what I'm doing. So after the grade was established, after all the crumbs were thrown out, after the gravel was thrown in to bring it up to grade and the jumping jack was run over the moistened subgrade three or four times, Brian moved his gear out and the next week Carl Broda came out to do another density test, to do another compaction test on the bottom of the footings. Because now we've removed all of the junk and we're down to what needs to be really strong because it's going to be supporting footings that are supporting a lot of weight, both from the weight of the backfill and the rockery wall, and from the weight of the overturning moment, retaining the lot as the house is placed and, and the work is done up top. So he drove his penetrometer down into the bottom of these footings, and you know what? It was harder than the proverbial stepmother's heart. We achieved bearing capacities of 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 pounds per square foot, far in excess of what was needed to support the calculations that Scott Harvey was making about footing sizes rebar layout, and all those technical details that are going to make the difference between success or failure. This is a pretty good sized little concrete undertaking. I've done stuff like this before over the years, but this is a neat one. And I really like doing it with Nate. I like doing it for the channel. It's squarely in my comfort zone, but I'll tell you what's not in my comfort zone, and that is turning it into movies, running the camera while I'm doing the work and worrying about microphones. We're learning a lot, a little frustrating, but we're figuring it out. I want to point out how much I appreciate the fact that you guys don't bust my chops over the video quality because we got to figure it out before we can get it right. If you're interested in the costs, we're going to have all of the costs on this project up on our Patreon page. For instance, Brian Reynolds, what I paid him for the excavation, we'll have that up there along with everything else. So go to the notes on the videos. It'll tell you how to get to the Patreon page. Check it out. and. Uh, I hope that you enjoy this process. I hope we're providing value for you. And I really hope you keep watching. Thanks.